Well, where is the carbon dioxide coming from? It's coming from the burning of fossil fuels, and I'll have a lot more to say about this. This graph is uh, from 1750 till now. Actually, you might as well start in 1850. On this scale are the uh, millions of tons of carbon dioxide being released in fossil fuel burning. That is coal, uh, natural gas, and oil, and the flaring of natural gas, and even cement production is a couple percent. Well, going back about 100 years, we were using a little bit more than 1% of the fossil fuels that we are now. This is the curve that we're on, so that in the year 20, 2005, we're releasing about 7 billion tons of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide into the air each year from fossil fuel burning. Of course, the total mass of the carbon dioxide is 44 divided by 12, 3 and 2 thirds times this, or about uh, 25 billion tons of carbon per year in, in the form of carbon dioxide. There is much, much more evidence that the carbon dioxide buildup that I showed you earlier from the Mauna Loa data is due to human activities from carbon-12, carbon-13 isotope ratios, from the spatial patterns, from direct measurements, from the penetration of radiocarbon into the ocean, we can see that this carbon dioxide buildup is due to human activity. About uh, of, this extra, of this extra carbon dioxide, about 80% is due to fossil fuel burning, and about 20% roughly is due to land clearing. Typically land being cleared, let's say in the Amazon, forest being destroyed for agricultural purposes. It's a combination of the above ground biomass being burnt and oxidized and the below ground organic matter which is exposed in land clearing that accounts for about 20% of this buildup. And as I say, fossil fuel burning accounts for the rest of it. So. This is now skipping to the United States uh, to show where our carbon dioxide emissions are coming from. Uh, the three main forms are the burning of coal. Uh, now, I've switched units to billions of metric tons CO2. So the to total is just about 6 billion tons of CO2 per year from the United States. The world total is about 25. So we release about 23% of the world's carbon dioxide due to our fuel burning in the United States. 2.1 billion tons per year coming from coal burning, 1.2 billion tons coming from natural gas, and 2.6 billion tons per year coming from our petroleum consumption in the United States. Now, just for completeness, I show that hydroelectric power releases roughly zero carbon dioxide, the burning of biomass, while it certainly produces carbon dioxide, the CO2 that's being produced in the burning was recently taken out of the atmosphere in photosynthesis, so the net exchange here is zero, geothermal power zero, wind power zero, nuclear power zero, just for completeness. Now, that was by source. By usage, this is where our carbon dioxide is coming from. Just generating electricity is causing the release of 2.3 out of the 6 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the United States annually. Uh, other industrial uses about 1.2. Light duty vehicles like uh, cars and, and light trucks, 1.2 and so forth. Residential, there are various ways to, to cut this pie, so to speak. Uh, heating and air conditioning, uh, transportation and so forth. There are very many different ways to define these sectors, but I wanted to give you a feel for the numbers. Well, the, the methane that's being released into the atmosphere is about two-thirds under human influence. The red part of this pie chart is methane sources globally on an annual basis that is under human influence, and the yellow part is natural sources of methane. So and the, probably the best known number on this whole chart is the enteric fermentation in ruminant animals like cows and sheep. So this is methane coming out of both ends of the animal. 
It's, it's the way animals work. The number has been known very well for nearly 100 years. The only thing that's changed is that the population of cows and sheep continues to grow. People have tried to suppress this inadvertent release of methane because it's a loss of about 10% of the daily caloric intake of these animals. So if you were trying to raise these animals, whether they be dairy or beef or, or sheep, you would want to suppress it. People have been trying forever have done zillions of measurements. I've done some of the measurements and you keep coming up with virtually the same number, 300 grams of methane per mature cow per day. You multiply by the number of cows, you've got the number. Natural gas production and handling the inadvertent mistake of uh, escape of methane from coal mining, municipal landfills where we bury fairly juicy organic matter and under oxygen-free conditions, the methanogenic bacteria produce methane. These numbers are reasonably well known. The rice paddy, where I've done any number of these measurements myself, this number is quite uncertain. The more data we get, the more uncertain it looks. Now, I mentioned that methane concentrations have increased over a factor of two. Very plausible that the human-controlled uh, methane emissions have more than doubled the amount of methane in the atmosphere. Okay, what does all this mean? Remember that I told you that the net sunlight received and absorbed by the Earth atmosphere system was about 237 watts per square meter, and it is. Well, this, I'm sorry, these figures are in the same units, watts per square meter, and they show the impact on the Earth's surface in fact, the lower atmosphere energy budget due to the CO2 increase that we've observed in the air, its concentration, it's causing about 1.6 to 1.7 watts per square meter of energy to be trapped in the lower atmosphere. Uh, methane is a figure about 40% as large, a little over 0.6 watts per square meter, nitrous oxide, several of the other greenhouse gases they add up to about 2.5 watts or 2.6 watts per square meter, which is more than 1% of the solar energy received on an annual basis or per unit time, per unit area. Now, those of you who've thought about the variation of the sun or any other star know that changing the output of the star or the sun by 1% takes a long time. You don't do that in a human lifetime the way this change has happened. So, this change is quite significant, more than 1% of a solar constant in one human lifetime, and it's growing. So right there, there should be a warning sign that we are tampering with the Earth's planetary energy budget. Whatever it leads to, good or bad, it's a big perturbation. Well, what is happening? This graph it happens to be a data set from uh, the GIS laboratory of NASA in New York, but there are many other similar data sets showing the temperature record of the land ocean average over the last 130 years or so when these measurements have been done well and consistently intercalibrated. Zero on this chart is not zero degrees. It's just a reference level. And in this graph, it's the 1951 to 1980 average. So if you take over the whole planet, the average temperature observed between 1951 and 80, that's zero on this graph. Everything that's above that point is just simply hotter than 1951 to 80, and everything that's below is colder than 1951 to 80. And what you see here are a couple of different things. First of all, there was generally a warming from the early 20th century through about 1940, then a slight cooling to about uh, 1975, and then a warming from the late 70s or 1980 until now. This warming, the rapidity of it, is faster than anything that's been observed before. And it's also the variance, so to speak, from the mean is more than any known physical mechanisms can generate. Now, there are always year-to-year -year changes, big El Nino events, the uh, volcanic events such as the... Uh, Pinatubo explosion in June of 1991, the planetary average temperature decreased for the next few months and the cooling was maintained for about 18 months into the end of 1992. And in fact, 